So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another session of Tehran Islamic Studies Monitor. Uh, and as I told before, uh, the, the, this, this, uh, the, the second round of the session is focused on uh, the philosophy and theology in the Islamic world. Uh, and I am very glad to uh, have here today uh, Nadia German and Mustafa Najafi, along with other authors of the chapter, uh, chapters of the book, uh, to discuss the work, the, their edited volume on philosophy and language in the Islamic world. Uh, and to be honest, this is the first time in this series of conversations that the work on the discussion is not a monograph, but uh, an edited volume. So, uh, so the structure uh, of the conversation will be a bit different. I think there is, uh, there is no discussant in the sense we had in previous sessions. Uh, and we'll talk to the editors of the volume, Nadia and Mustafa, respectively. And, and then uh, some of the authors of the chapters, uh, uh, who uh, and I, I am glad to have them here now. Uh, I think so far we have uh, Professor David Vishnov and uh, Professor Teriel Buhafa here, and they will also talk about uh, give an introduction of their chapters. And obviously, we will end with uh, with questions uh, questions and answers. Um, so, and, and this would be the structure of our, our conversation. Um, so I will begin by an introduction of uh, our guests and then uh, pass to Nadia to continue with an introduction of the idea behind the uh, series and the book uh, and so on and so forth. And Nadia German is professor of philosophy at the University of Freiburg. She specializes in the philosophy of language, epistemology, theory of cognition and metaphysics uh, with a particular focus on pre-modern Arabic Islamic thought. She obtained her PhD from Tübingen University and has had research projects and teaching positions in Louvain, Freiburg, Boston, Yale, Baltimore, and Geneva. Her publications include a monograph about the problems surrounding time during the 9th to 11th centuries, uh, which is published uh, in 2006 by Brill, and two edited volumes, uh, one on the origin and nature of language and logic in medieval Islamic Jewish and Christian thought, which is published, as far as I know, uh, in 2020, uh, last year, by Repuls, and the current work on the discussion, Philosophy and Language in the Islamic World, um, and she has published a number of articles on different aspects of Arabic philosophy, and has also authored the entry on Al-Farabi's Philosophy of Society and Religion in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And Mustafa Najafi is currently a fellow at University of Lucerne, he obtained his PhD at the, in, in 2019 from the University of Freiburg. His dissertation was about Fahadina Razi's philosophy of language, which I think will be published as his first monograph by the Gruyter. Uh, he has also co-edited the current volume, and his areas of research include uh, logic, language, and epistemology in the Islamic world, metaphysics in the Islamic world, Islamic intellectual history and historiography, and Persian and Arabic uh, manuscript studies. So uh, thank you, Mustafa and Nadia, for uh, for joining the session. I'm very glad to have you here. And let's uh, let's begin by by the idea behind the series. Let's begin by Nadia uh, with with a discussion of the idea behind the series because I, as far as I know, you are the editor of the series. You are the co-editor of the series, uh, Philosophy in the Islamic World in Context, um, and. Uh, and also the idea behind the uh, current work and the project, the bigger project uh, at the background of the work. And the floor is yours. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Mohsen. And thanks, first of all, for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to, to present our work. I don't know what, whether you've had the occasion to, to see the, the copy of the book. So it, it's beautiful. You should buy it. Um, but this is enough of advertising. Um, so let me begin with, um, um, as Mohsen asked, um, with uh, a few words on the series, um, uh, which is um, a very new, a very recent re series by the Greuter. And this is just the second volume. The first was on philosophy and uh, jurisprudence. Um, and the idea behind it is, um, it's, it's, it's a very um, concise idea, which is already um, indicated a little bit in the title. So it's uh, philosophy in the Islamic world in context. So that's the name of the series. Um, and this idea of um, 
looking at philosophy, but not just in and of itself, but in its context, in its setting, in its environment where it lives, so to speak, or lived, if we have a look at it historically speaking, um, this is this is an idea um, first brought up and developed um, um, by a group of scholars, um, most of whom, or many of whom, are on the board of this series. So one of them uh, am I self, uh, myself, but then there are Peter Adamson, Risa Hajat Puch, uh, Ulrich Rudolf, and George Tanner, um, most of whom you probably know from, from other fields of, of research. And there are a few other people um, of the group um, which, uh, or which formed this group, which originally thought of setting up this series and, um, and then decided to, to go along with the Greuther. So, so this group of people, it's, it's mostly people. So there is a, a very funny coincidental, so to speak, kind of, um, uh, of, um, of, um, situation that since a few years in southern Germany, Switzerland and Austria. So in a, in this kind of, um, German speaking sphere, um, there is a high density of fairly high density or an unprecedented density of, uh, of researchers at universities doing philosophy in the Islamic world. And so at some stage we got together and decided we should do something together, given that we are so close to each other. And seeing the different backgrounds of all these people, so everyone has their own emphasis and their own approach to philosophy, we thought like, well, this is exactly what we should do. We should look at philosophy from these various angles and acknowledge that it's not an enterprise which is, so to speak, um, which comes out of the blue and doesn't have any context, but really take that into account, look at philosophy from exactly this kind of situated perspective. And so this is how we came, uh, we came to this idea of um, um, conceiving this series or planning this series, which is usually preceded by a workshop. Um, so, so to speak, the test case where we try to, where we bring together people um, on a specific topic, um, and um, and then explore the possibilities, and on this basis, the the volumes are um, developed or fleshed out. And so our turn was um, so the first, as I said, was philosophy and jurisprudence, and our turn, the second volume was philosophy and language. Um, and so now the question, of course, is who is we? And 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 this um, already brings me to um, um, the book itself and the idea behind the book. So. I mean, the editors are Mustafa and myself, but the idea behind the book is is um, conceived by many more minds, one of whom is among us today because she's one of the authors, that's Feriel, and she'll say a few things later on on her own chapter. But um, um, she she became part of the team that I would like to mention now. So when I, when I came to Freiburg like eight years ago or something, I was uh, able to set up a research group and this research group, which is called, or which was called Lidiac, so it stands for Linguistic Disciplines in the Arabic Culture. Um, and it's Arabic culture, not Islamic culture, because the focus was from the outset was the, was language. Um, and so it's the Arabic language, which, which was at its core. Um, and, and so it is, it is, it is this kind of, approach, um, an approach looking at philosophy, and not only philosophy, as I will say in a second, but looking at philosophy, but through the lens of language, which was from the outset, which was um, basically what we tried to do in this research group. So so I was working, com coming just from this kind of background, specifically on, on Falsefa, um originally, and then moved more or less in, uh, increasingly into in other fields like Nahu and uh, Adab. Um, Mustafa, who, who joined the team very early on as a doctoral student back then, um, he decided to look into what we could perhaps call um, kalam, usul al fiqh, but also with these intersections in, in falsafa and mantiq. Um, then there was another guy um, with whom I co-authored one of the chapters in the book, uh, Noel Rivera, um, and his emphasis was on Nahbu specifically. So, so you see, the, the, the way we try to set up the team was in this kind of interdisciplinary approach. So looking from the different disciplines at language and trying to figure out, so what does that mean for the way language is conceived of, is treated, is discussed? And, and so um, this is also this kind of interdisciplinary approach is what is at the back of the series, which, which is why it's always 
focusing on one specific field in relation to um, philosophy. And so in this research group, Lydia, um, which um, started, as I said, about 2013, I think, something like this. So we, we started working. Mostafa, for instance, and perhaps he'll say a few things later on, um, wrote his, his dissertation, which is now going to be published with the De Gruyter pretty soon. Um, so so um, within this research group, to which later on um, uh, also Feri al um came, and so she joined the team with her focus on Usul al-Fiqh, so yet another focus. So in this team, um, we try to explore these various disciplines and have these kind of meetings um, where we try to see what that means for language more generally conceived, philosophically speaking. Um, and there we had this idea of um, conceiving and uh, organizing a workshop on philosophy and language. And of course, this is a, an extremely vast field. Um, I, I think perhaps um, maybe just a, a very short note. I mean, as you probably all know from, from the outset, and now I'm really talking about um, the emergence of Islam and the emergence of the very first scholarly enterprises that, that are testified in the sources uh, available nowadays. So from, from the outset, language was one of the, the core issues discussed among various groups, a broad range of groups. Uh, I mean, just think of Tafsir, just think of, I already mentioned Kalam, Usul al-Fiqh, um, Nahu, um, then Adab or Bayan, if you, or whatever you wish to call it. And then, of course, at some stage also Falsafa, even though Falsafa in this narrow sense um, is perhaps the least interested in language as an object, as a philosophical object in and of itself. So it's perhaps much more interesting to look into these other disciplines. And so this is what we tried to do. And then we decided, okay, to focus on something which is manageable within a workshop or within the frame of a workshop, but then also later on um, with, with uh, creating, with bringing about, with publishing a book, we decided to focus on um, the terms intention and signification. So those of you who know Arabic, of course, already know, know this, well, this is ma'ana. <laughs> so in a way it's centered on, on the notion of ma'ana. Um, and we decided also to focus it uh, on, the on, the first, on the first like four centuries. So like ninth to 12th century. And also, so this is the workshop, but then the book of course also is centered a little bit um, both on on these um, on these issues and also on um, this um, time frame a little bit it, lo it goes a little bit beyond but so in a way it's 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 incomplete in many ways as it must be so first of all i think it's the first enterprise of this kind trying to give some sort of overview over philosophy and language in this period um, but of course it must remain a patchwork so, I mean, in the meantime, there is a, a quite substantial scholarship in different fields like Usul al um, also Falsafa, increasingly also um, uh, Bayan or Balara, or what you might call it. Um, but it's still, so also, of course, Kalam. Um, but also, but, but, but of course, there are many fields which are underdeveloped, uh, which haven't been researched very well yet. So it's, it's, it must be deficient in this regard. It must be deficient as I already indicated in terms of the chronology. So it can't cover everything until today, uh, let's say something like this. Um, it must be focused on specific topics and thinkers for that matter. Um, and, and then of course, we also had difficulties. Not all of the people who came to the workshop actually were, were available to write a chapter. So we had to make concessions on this. So for instance, one of the chapters I really would have loved to have there, but um, she had uh, the author had to draw back because of other time pressures and, and these kind of things that we all know, uh, was on Al-Jahith, so in the ninth century, on this, this famous Adab uh, thinker. Um, so that there are a few lacunae that are really sad, I think, but still it's, it's a first attempt to cover at least quite some ground and and um, and in a way um, and now I'm already making a transition to 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 Mustafa who is then going to take over as indicated in a way we I mean as a team and now I'm speaking particularly of Mustafa and myself the two who ended up editing the book 
Um, we conceive it as, as, so to speak, a first, a first approach, um, and it's it's basically something that we continue to pursue. So, in a way, of course, Mustafa, in his uh, soon forthcoming book um, on the philosophy of language, but then also in in other joint ventures that that we are currently planning and that are supposed to further develop um, and flesh out um, this uh, highly fascinating. Um, topic of language in the Islamic um, culture seen from a philosophical point of view. So I think perhaps this is um, this is what I should say here and with a, a with a view to to the time perhaps here I should just hand over to to Mustafa. Yeah, sure. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Nadia. So before picking up on a few things that Nadia uh, already uh, said, I uh, would like also to join Nadia in thanking Mohsen and uh, the theology faculty, the Faculty of Theology and Islamic Studies of Tehran University for giving us this platform to share with you and uh, uh, others who probably later will uh, have access to this. Uh, some of our uh, research interests, uh, which have which have occupied us for a quite long time now, and uh, the first result of which, the first concrete result of which, is the topic of discussion today. And I'm very glad also that we have some of the authors also with us who can uh, join the discussion later on. So. Um, I joined the research group, the Lidiac research group, uh, in the uh, at the end of 2012. So my main focus back then was in the field of falsafa, and I uh, used this term as an indication of a very specific philosophical approach within the intellectual history of uh, uh, in the Islamic world. Mm, with figures like Ibn Sina and Farabi as uh, the protagonists. So I found it uh, a bit difficult to uh, adapt to the framework of the project as it was already a conceived project. Uh, more frankly said or more bold boldly put, I found it difficult to consider what's been going on in the other fields as really philosophical. Now, it doesn't matter whether they are philosophical or not, but I found them, the more I delved into these different fields, I had also a background in, in uh, many diverse fields like Kalam and Balagha and Nahu and so on, the more I delved into these disciplines in the framework of the project, and from this perspective, uh, the more convinced I was, as were also the other members of the team, there is something more substantial going on. It's not just like a random discussion of language here or there. It's not like few linguistic questions that people in various fields need to handle before getting into their real business be it usul al-fiqh or kalam or, or, or the other fields. No, we were convinced that there is something more substantial going on and we aimed to get our hands on it as, as far as possible. So, uh, some fields came up earlier like uh, kalam, usul al-fiqh and um, Nahu, obviously, linguistic disciplines in general. Um, and um, we uh, worked further as a team for quite like uh, five years, I guess, before we came to the idea that the diversity, the, the disciplinary diversity that we find in the discussions and uh, philosophical uh, investigations concerning language in the Islamic world is somehow reflected also in the scholarship on language and related issues. So uh, we decided to uh, bring together all these scholars working from different perspectives on language using different methodologies, using different uh, um, 
inroads into these questions, many of whom we were lucky to get a, a good number of uh, scholars who uh, had original um, approaches to these issues, um, who came together within a conference that Nadia mentioned in 2017, and uh, we uh, further uh, we're able to elaborate these uh, contributions further in, in the form of this edited volume. So, chrono chronologically, we covered, we decided to cover the a period which we found uh, as formative or foundational for the uh, preceding one, uh, for the preceding centuries, meaning from the 9th to the 12th century. And uh, we had no disciplinary uh, focus. I mean, it was as as it's uh, as, as as essential to the pro as it was essential to the project an interdisciplinary enterprise. But we tried to find a thematic focus with a concentration on the central discussion around love and mana or word or meaning. So. Um, the contributions to the volume um, were uh, accordingly from all different sources. I mean, not all of the different uh, fields which are engaged with these disciplines, but uh, from a good number of them. And we began the volume with a contribution of David Bennett um, focusing on uh, early theological works mainly among the Mu'tazila, or with a very strong Mu'tazilite um, inclination. So, um, focusing on the works of figures like Hisham al-Hakam, Abu al-Hudayl al-Allaf, Muammar ibn Abbad. Uh, these are highly original and, 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 and complex uh, works, and um, David Bennett tried there to focus on this notion of mana in these works. Um, to show how they were puzzled with this idea, with this with this concept, and how they tackled this concept at uh, the interface of ontology and epistemology. What's interesting is that it uh, comes out that they agreed on one point, that mana, in the first instance, relates to cognition. It is something that can be cognized with respect to object, something that is there even if it cannot be described in terms of established metaphysical concepts. So, after beginning the discussion on mana in these early theological works, um, our next author, Jonathan Owens, uh, dedicates uh, one of our chapters to uh, the early philologists, main figures like Sibawai, uh, who were engaged deeply with love. Uh, so, Owens presents a very a highly technical uh, uh, study of the um, uh, of, 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 of Sibawai and uh, specifically Sibawai's phonetics. More precisely, on his theory of voicing. Um, so, the interesting um, thing, we were lucky to have also Owens with us because also these highly technical issues concerning language provided a kind of material basis for further philosophical developments which we have in other authors, like Ibn Jinni, the uh, famous uh, grammarian from the 9th and early 11th, uh, 10th and early 11th century, uh, who is the uh, protagonist of our next chapter by Nadia and uh, our ex-colleague Noel Rivera. Uh, um, later Nadia will say a few words um, on, 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 on their chapter, but uh, dueling on the intricacies and subtleties of the Arabic grammar, Ibn Jinni developed a fully-fledged theory of language its anchorage in physical reality, meaning sounds, its ideal makeup, that is grammatical structure, in perfect harmony with nature, and the semiotic power 
that is ma'ani resulting from its constitution. After the chapter on Ibn Jinni um, and the more linguistic uh, disciplines, uh, the book develops further in the field of logic or at the intersection of linguistic disciplines and logic by the contribution of Alexander Key, who focuses on the notion of ma'na and the problem of ambiguity across two fields, adab and logic. So, um, he, uh, Key undertakes a comparative examination of Ibn Sina's treatment of equivocity which developed within the framework of the latter's engagement with Aristotelian logic. And he thus identifies the conceptual differences that fundamentally distinguish the approaches of Adab and Mantiq. So in, already in his contribution, it comes out that uh, Ibn Sina is a central figure in uh, discussions surrounding this specific notion. This centrality of Ibn Sina comes uh, completely out when we go further down in the book and to the contribution of Tony Street um, on Ibn Sina's, specifically on Ibn Sina's tripartite theory of signification and its development or the engagement of uh, logicians in the 13th century logic with this tripartite, uh, tripartite theory. Uh, they debated this theory, they developed and modified this theory in uh, different ways. Uh, two groups, basically, the Razians, the followers of Fakhreddin al-Razi, and the Tusians, or the followers of Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, were engaged in these controversies, and uh, Tony Street uh, shows us in this chapter how thrilling these developments were in um, in connection with Avicenna's uh, signification theory. After having dealt with this uh, issue in the within the logical context, we move to our next chapter, which is a chapter by um, Bilal uh, Ibrahim, who explores the epistemological dimension introduced into the religious sciences by Avicenna and logic. Uh, so the main emphasis is on Fakhreddin al-Razi, another central figure in these uh, discussions, and a secondary emphasis is on Ibn Taymiyyah. So Ibrahim scrutinizes the problem of what can serve as evidence in legal as well as theological reasoning, which leads him to a critical reassessment of the alleged opposition between reason and revelation in the Ash'ari tradition. We continue in Usul al-Fiqh uh, with our next author, who uh, we have the honor to have also with us today, David Vishanov, uh, who dedicates his uh, chapter to theories of divine speech. Uh, I'll leave it uh, to to David later to say a few words about his uh, his own chapter, but accordingly, uh, but according to his chapter, but in his chapter, um, he asks, what is the nature of the divine speech of Qur'an, the word of God? Is it merely informative, instructive human, instructing humans about what they are supposed to believe and do? Or is it actually performative? That is, does it bring about certain facts, properties, attitudes, uh, and so on. In his chapter, he tackles on the ideas and accounts of a Shafi'i, uh, the Mu'tazilite Abdul Jabbar, uh, the Hanbali Abu Ya'la ibn, ibn al farra and the Maliki Ash'ari Abu Bakr al-Baqillani, and the Hanafi Abu Zayd al-Dabusi. The next chapter by Robert Gleave tackles the problem of how to grasp divine intention. Uh, we are uh, still in the field of usul al-fiqh. So uh, the author he picks uh, 
up is Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Tusi, the Shi'i Usuli, uh, whose principles governing the approach to the intended meaning of God's speech are assessed by means of the conceptual tools offered by Paul Grice's pragmatics. Our next contribution by Feriel Buhafa, uh, who, who we have also here today with us, shifts the, the focus from divine again to human language and focuses on uh, a very interesting aspect of the de linguistic developments or the theoretical developments concerning the origin of language in the Islamic world. She focuses on the Hanbali Mu'tazari Abu Wafa Ali ibn Aqil um, to show that religious scholars, contrary to the common view in contemporary research, continue to discuss the origin of human language and even nourish the notion of language development and change. So I hope uh, she uh, could uh, tell us a few words uh, uh, about her contribution uh, later on. Uh, at, at the end of uh, the uh, book, we have the concluding chapter of um, uh, Muhammad Yunus Ali, uh, who tries to bring together the uh, what he calls or who he calls medieval Muslim legal theorists and modern linguists. So he, he tries to uh, give a general uh, um, a, a general classification of all the uh, all the various uh, sub subclasses of of meaning offered by scholars like Imam al Harabain al Juwaini, Ibn al Hajib, uh, among the Usulis, uh, and presented in a uh, linguistically informed uh, terminology. Uh, he, he kind of tries to bring into a dialogue these two uh, major groups. So, as it is clear from uh, from this uh, very brief introduction of the chapters, uh, our authors cover many diverse fields uh, within the traditional uh, fields of um, uh, the fields in the Islamic uh, intellectual uh, engagement and uh, with a focus on, on this fundamental issue concerning uh, love and mana and uh, tackle the questions which uh, rise uh, according to this account, according to the positions they take also theological and, and, and other problems to also contextualize all these discussions um, uh, in their conceptual contexts. Um, so with that said, um, I uh, think before passing uh, the word also to the authors uh, present today with us, I give the, back, the word back to you, Mohsen. Maybe, maybe if there are some common questions about the book as a whole or the project in general, maybe we can tackle that and then move to the to the other uh, authors. Great. Thank you. It was a very interesting and uh, dense introduction of the overview of the book. Um, and I, I, I think uh, maybe before we open it up to the questions and answers, maybe uh, it would be better to, uh, to have uh, the introduction overview of the chapters of the authors who are uh, here. Uh, I think we have also two of authors, uh, or with Nadia, uh, three of the authors here. And it would be interesting to listen to their introduction of the chapters. Um, if, if it's okay, I, I think we'll maybe begin by Feriel to say some words about, about her chapter. I should uh, enable, disable my... Uh, my webcam to enable Serial's webcam. So, uh, thank you again, Serial, for joining, uh, and 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 we are at your service to to listening to your introduction of the chapter. Uh, thank you, Mahsen, for organizing this event. Um, I am particularly pleased uh, to actually um, see my previous colleague from uh, Freiburg, and it's quite. Um, 
endearing to hear, the, uh, to hear these um, reflections about the projects that we've been really uh, engrossed on for a number of years and I, uh, I'd like to join um, uh, them in, in, in a way to um, emphasize that uh, I think what really the main outcome of the, of the conversations we had is really how much there is in this area of uh, philosophy of language which can only be done as Nadia has kind of pointed out in a more rather interdisciplinary and um, as one of the, I think, uh, I think it was Sajad mentioned uh, something about the ex expensive view of philosophy. Um, uh, obviously, the, 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 this book, this this volume, and the previous volume too for philosophy and jurisprudence shows that um, I think the future of the study of Arabic philosophy um, is going toward new frontiers where. Um, there are sub areas of philosophy that that in the modern context of the study of philosophy, such as philosophy of language uh, or philosophy of ethics or philosophy of actions, etc., are actually for, uh, um, are areas that can be uh, in fact um, explored and developed within the the, the realm of um, Arabic philosophy in general and. In, in this perspective, uh, a, the study of Islamic thought in general, or Arabic thought, whatever you want to call it. So, just uh, I just wanted to add that, um, and uh, let me probably go straight into my uh, to uh, to say a few things about my chapter. Um, my piece after Adam, uh, uh, as the title, uh, Ibn Aqil on language origin, change, and expansion. Uh, I mean, Mustafa said a few things. I'll, I'll just add uh, basically my main argument and, and some of the points I wanted to explore and probably things that I would like to further uh, explore in the future. Um, so what I basically do is revisit the, the, the debate on language inception in, uh, the, um, in Islamic thought. We all know that uh, often when you talk about language origin, um, uh, people think of the two main position, at least, uh, I mean, there, one could think of subdivision within these, but the two main positions were the um, uh, conventionalist position, which perceived language as a social convention, often uh, attributed to the uh, Mortezalites, and the, um, the, the revelationist, as it's often called, um, a position which perceived language as a divine inspiration, attributed to the Asherites. Um, so the one could say the Muwada in Arabic versus in Ham. Um, so when, when you look at the literature, often people emphasize this, the kind of the theological implication beyond these, uh, this, the, the, the two camps. So obviously a conventionalist view dovetails with the Mortezalites doctrine of the uncreatedness of the Quran, versus rather a theistic view of the Asherites which seem to emphasize this divine inspiration. And that seems to be um, some sort of a dominant view that this is the, this, this is what the, the debate on the origin of, of, of language ended up. Once the theistic view um, gained ground, the question lost its um, kind of um, lost interest among scholars. Um, well, there is some truth to that in, in the sense that people, uh, you see scholars probably um, it's often perceived in around the thir uh, 11th century, try to start to develop some sort of a middle ground between a revelationist and a conventionalist view. But that doesn't mean that the question lost its um, um, its vitality. And in fact, I would say, the um, taking in a, a perspective of philosophy of language, we can really um, discern interesting questions uh, that go beyond the rationalist versus theistic um, perspective uh, um, of the debate uh, associated to the Mortezalites, conventionalists, and the Asherites, um, um, rather revelationists. And uh, obviously, I try to um, uh, kind of unpack these, um, these kind of this perspective, uh, which I would say is uh, very much a perspective uh, of uh, uh, it, it, in fact, um, convey certain questions that can be put under philosophy of language, that is the idea of what is speech, 
uh, what is, um, uh, how is speech conveyed, uh, what are the modalities of speech, how does language develop, these are questions that I would, um, I, 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 I demonstrate in my piece, Ibn Aqil actually was interested in. And in fact, in raising objections against both uh, revelationists and conventionalists of, uh, uh, of the time, he comes to uh, bring in really interesting um, insights about how language is, um, uh, is originated. Um, regardless whether you admit a revelationist view that is inspired by God or it's a human, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, humanly originated. So what I would like to do is just to focus on three important ideas that I, I try to develop in the piece, which is, first of all, the question of how does he define divine speech? And uh, since he adopts, uh, since he, he basically outlines that language is actually uh, conveyed through uh, four, four modes. First of all, divine imposition, second, divine um, um, uh, inspiration, uh, third, human uh, convention, and fourth, qiyas, uh, or uh, um, what, what he tries to define as um, what I call semantic uh, extension uh, linked to tisa of, of language. Um, so in, in the first, um, but, but to, to, to be able to understand how he conceives of these four modes, we need to first of all understand how he, um, he perceives of how God def defines speech and how God actually delivers speech to human beings. So, and, and in fact, what I try to um, emphasize is that he has this very expensive view of speech in general, divine speech, which is not limited to um, speech as literal, but clearly tries to um, not only account for the what, what uh, one could call from the perspective of philosophy of language, implicature or even context, but even in inner meaning. For God can deliver, does not only deliver speech, but God can deliver inner meaning in the sense of delivering uh, a language into people's hearts. And um, that actually shows uh, how expensive his understanding of how God can teach his language. And obviously here he's, re he's really targeting those who had a very limited understanding of uh, of the verse, and he taught Adam uh, all names, Adam al -asma kullaha. and he emphasizes how teaching does not uh, is not limited and cannot be restricted to memorization. For God can um, speak various in, in a way various modes of of, of uh, communication. The second point I wanted to uh, I emphasize in my piece is is related to human convention and specifically uh, how he um, uh, understands this uh, human development of language in a, in, from a perspective of uh, a, um, of fitra, the, the notion fitra, which is obviously a, 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 that has a genealogy in Islamic uh, history from, from al-Jahaz. Uh, and in fact, he, uh, Ibn Aqil emphasizes how um, people come to develop language on the basis of need. So, uh, first of all, he emphasizes how they have this capacity to have mental image uh, uh, about things and how they develop uh, a language um, on the basis of uh, things that they need. So, the idea of the, the need for shelter actually brings into mind the, uh, the, the, the image of a door and the image of the door uh, requires, uh, 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 leads to coining the word uh, door. The last point which I find is, a, is, is um, uh, rather very intriguing and, and needs further exploration is Qiyas or as I, as I uh, refer to semantic extension uh, which basically, um, I mean it's, it's, uh, it's the um, it's a concept that he uses to define how language develops, and and um, specifically he refers to concept uh, to to uh, figurative language. Uh, obviously, language develops through uh, from the literal to the non-literal, and obviously, f figurative language is, uh, falls within that uh, perspective. And uh, what is really interesting about his conception of 
semantic expansion is that he tries to um, refer to the affinity between uh, majaz, a figurative meaning, and qiyas fiqhi, traditional uh, reasoning. And uh, this affinity really is rooted in a logical understanding. And this is what I try to show how is this, uh, how he tries to kind of premise the extension from the first uh, kind of coinage or uh, the, what he calls the mantur to the, uh, what is the, to the maskud, uh, uh, from the spoken to the unspoken. Um, like juridical reasoning, where you have an extension of the, of the analogy from the first uh, uh, original case to the new case, um, this, this type of relationship is premised on, um, I would say, logical criteria related to uh, genus, uh, jins, uh, specificity, khasisa, or sura uh, form. So that shows how he seems to understand this um, this re uh, this kind of um, uh, operation on uh, on the basis of some sort of a relational ground, and and um, that also shows how language developed from uh, uh, um, uh, in 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 terms of. Um, Building certain uh, uh, building relationship grounded on either similitude, uh, comparison, or even um, uh, contradiction. So uh, I, 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 I won't say any further. I think I dwell too much on this. But uh, I just want to say that um, that this is uh, obviously shows how there is a lot of um, interesting ideas to look into specifically. This, this affinity between analogical reasoning and majaz, uh, which um, I would say have both hermeneutical and logical dimension, which shows how these operation needs to be understood both from a cognitive side and, and a logical uh, side to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your elaboration on this chapter. Uh, let, let's turn to uh, Professor Vishanov, if you agree to uh, to say some words, uh, so uh, I think I should uh, disable your uh, webcam, Ariel. And sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and and so yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you, Mustin, for inviting us. Um, so my chapter is on performative and informative speech. Um, you know, what, what modern philosophers of language talk about as, as speech acts, uh, performative speech being speech that, uh, that, that brings about a new state of affairs so if, rather than just informing. So if I say, I am planning to come tomorrow, that's I'm giving you information. But if I say, I promise I will come tomorrow, that's now I've created an obligation, right? So that's the basic distinction that I'm looking at. And um, I'm coming at this out of my interest in usul al-fiqh. I'm not a, a, a falsafa person, not trained in falsafa, unfortunately. Um, but uh, in my pre earlier work on uh, the formation of hermeneutics within the discipline of usul al-fiqh, I was particularly interested in hermeneutics rather than theory of language per se, but of course that got me into the theory of language. One of the things I'd noticed in looking at the development of uh, ling discussions of language in usul al fiqh was that um, there was a strong tendency to view language as purely descriptive and informative. Language, uh, and really the whole discipline of usul al fiqh is set up to use the language of the Quran as evidence for answering legal questions. So it's a source of information. And that struck me as curious, given how the Quran itself speaks about God's speech as creative, um, not just informative. But, but that's what I had found in Usul al -Fiqh. And so I, when, uh, when Nadia invited me to join this workshop in, in, in Freiburg, I thought, I'm gonna explore a little bit more and figure out where, where did, what happened to the notion that God's speech is performative? Did it ever catch on? Of course, in later Usul al Fiqh, there's a discussion of Khabar versus Insha, um, essentially informative and performative speech. Um, it turned out that I, I had overlooked this, but uh, Abu Bakr al Dabusi, Abu Zayd al Dabusi, had, um, had, had a, used those terms. He appears, as far as I can tell, to be the first to use them in an Usul al Fiqh context, to use Ikhbar or Khabar and Insha to mean uh, 
informative and performative speech in an usul al fiqh context. And um, so I, I went back and looked at his taqwim uh, al-adillah and, uh, and found that in the two sections where he uses these terms and discusses them, he, he does so rather differently. It seemed contradictory. Um, you know, early on, he, he seemed to say that all of God's speech is just informative, even in sha' is just a, a kind of a category of khabar. Um, but then later in the book, he seemed to say that um, uh, actually God's commands are performative. They, they bring about obligations. And I, so as I puzzled over this, I was drawn into studies by Aaron Zaisal and others of Dabusi's theory of the Hanafi theory of asbab and the, the notion that there are two kinds of obligation. There's ab nafsul wujub, obligation itself, um, which rests, is sort of grounded in the nature of reality. So that's sort of a Mu'tazilite view of ethical norms grounded in the nature of reality. Um, but then they had wujub uh, al So things might be sort of intrinsically, a certain, the uh, general obligation to, uh, you know, to eat and engage in trade and things like this um, are built into the natural order of things. But the obligation for a particular person to do something at a particular time is only brought about by God's addressing that person specifically. And, and that was then how he seemed to be thinking, he seemed to be thinking in these two different ways. And at one point he would say God's speech is informative. It just tells us about the basic moral, the, the basic moral structure of the universe, but that God's speech is performative. It's in shat when it addresses individuals and make, and, uh, and he says, it's like when, um, it's like when somebody buys something from a merchant. The sale has made payment incumbent, as incumbent on the buyer. So that's just built into the way things work. Once you've bought something, you, you have to pay. But when the merchant says, okay, you've bought it, so now hand over the money, that creates an immediate obligation on you personally to fulfill that obligation right away. Um, so God's speech is performative when it does that to us. Um, so, and I, and I think, so I think I solved what appeared to be a contradiction in Dabusi's reflections on performative and informative speech. And I, I thought about what I had seen in other figures I had studied uh, looking at usul al fiqh um, and, and I compared it this way. Abdul Jabbar, you know, would say God's speech only ever gives information about the law. That's all it can do. Very strong position. Um, whereas others like uh, Abu Yala ibn al Farra tended to regard God's speech as though it was God addressing every individual very particularly across time and space, saying, uh, hey you, um, I'm talking to you, do this. Um, rather than sort of giving information about what's good for our, for our benefit, as Abu Jabbar said. So, so Abu Yala treated commands, for instance, as performative. They bring about a new obligation, like a master speaking to a servant and saying, bring me a drink of water, just brings about an obligation right there. And between those two poles, it seemed to me that a lot of usul al-fiqh, including, here I talked about Abu Bakr al-Baqalani and then ad dabusi himself, in a sense, try to have it both ways. They want, because usul al-fiqh um, uses language, the language of revelation, as evidence, as a source of information, they have to view it as God's speech as informative. And some, like uh, Dabusi, want to see God's speech as information about a natural moral reality. But at the same time, um, by Dabusi's time, certainly for Bakalani, and by Dabusi's time, this is becoming more common. There was a strong tendency to want to see the law as imposed by God through God's command, not just an, a more a natural moral reality that God tells us about, as for Abu Jabbar, but rather there was, uh, you know, there were no obligations until God commanded people to do certain things. And that view, the notion that God's speech is performative, lines up very well with that view of the nature of morality, that it. God's speech brings about obligation. Morality is the kind of thing that is only brought about by a, a command. Um, so that tension between the desire to treat God's speech as information and the desire to see God's speech as bringing about morality and law, I think uh, probably has stuck with usul al-fiqh and has kept the notion of insha' 
it has been present, but it also has not dominated. And the, the approach to language in Usul al has tended to remain somewhat more informative. Um, so I think, from my, to my mind, this is an example of that, what Mustafa was speaking earlier of saying, there's something more substantial going on in these discussions of language across disciplines. It's not just linguistic. In Usul al people have often thought the linguistic preliminaries are just preliminaries. We have to figure out how we interpret language so we can get onto the real business of interpreting, of creating law, constructing law. Um, I, I think the theorizing here, there's something more substantial going on. One's theory of language, informative versus performative, and other things about whether God's speech is created or eternal things. These, these kind of ideas about God's speech and the way language works, especially when it's God speaking, really are tied into the these thinkers' views of what morality is and how, how it operates. Um, so I, I agree with Mustafa that there's more going on in theories of language. It connects to other larger theological, philosophical issues, um, not mere tools for speaking. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Well, well thank you very thank much. You very much. Um, and I, I think before we... Uh, open up, open it up to the uh, questions. Uh, we, we have some minutes. If, if if you want Nadia to elaborate on your chapter, or we just go to the questions and answers. Yeah, maybe I just say a few words. I keep it very short because I think otherwise um, um, there's not enough time to to discuss and and raise questions. Um, and and I think quite a few things have already been said. So um, I could just point at them and, uh, um, and say a few additional things. So the chapter I've written is, is, is basically it's co-written with Noel, our former colleague, as I said. So when I speak about myself, I'm speaking about myself as an author, but it doesn't mean that it's just, um, so it's a collaborative work, just to keep that in mind. And so the chapter is, is called um, The Causes of Grammar, Ibn Jini on the Nature of Language. So Ibn Jini, as Mustafa already said in his overview, uh, is a thinker of the 10th century, so he died in 1002, 1002. Um, and so um, um, he is a, he's known as a grammarian, as a Nahu, um, or Nahui. And the interesting thing, and here in a way this um, connects very well with what, what uh, Professor Vishanov just said at the end, um, in a way, what, what is really interesting about Ibn Jini and now particularly his book, Chasais, and Chasais, so the specialties or the special points or the subtle points referring to grammar. Um, so in a way, it's, it's, it's really a substantial engagement with language as a theoretical object, or as I would say, as a philosophical object. Um, because, I mean, if you go through this book, which is, which is of course, extremely extremely big and extremely um, uh, huge. Um, but if you go through this book, what he really tries to make sense of is what kind of phenomenon is language, which comes across in so many various aspects that we deal with in grammar. And so he tries to make sense of um, these features that language, of course, the, 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 what he has in mind when he talks about language is, is the Arabic language. So this is always at the basis of his theoretical reflections. But what he tries to figure out is how could such a thing come about um, in this kind of marvelous construction that we can grasp by way of grammar in our grammar books. Um, and, and that's what I find so fascinating about. So basically these theoretical views um, in the back of his analyses of um, the various aspects dealt with in, in grammar or more broadly conceived in, in linguistics and philology. So it's, it's really this all-embracing field that, that he addresses in his book. And, and it's um, what, 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 what he tries to develop, and these are the things that uh, Noel and I looked into, is, is basically a theory, so an, 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 we could say an ontology of language. Um, and at the same time, an account of how some such thing could have come about across history, so to speak. So in a way, he's he's dwelling on, on these narratives that you probably know from philology or at least from classical philology um, with this idea um, 
that um, the, um, the, there are the Bedouins who have this wonderful, uh, extraordinarily uh, extraordinary instinct about language. So if you if you if you're not sure whether you make a grammatical mistake, you just need to ask the Bedouins. Um, and if you don't have a Bedouin, then you should should just take one of the Diwans and uh, old poetry and look it up, and 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 there there you find how it really must be expressed and what the grammatical features really are. So so but but he basically uses all these kind of um, um, stories or ideas that that were pretty much in vogue at his time and, and already earlier. Um, but what he tries to do is to interpret them in a way and um, make sense of them in a way which basically explains why language could come across or come about as this marvelous entity that it is. And that it not only is because he was an Arab, um, not a, perhaps a native Arab, but um, at least his parents probably weren't. But anyway, but um, not because he is an Arab and feels like, well, this is the best language that exists. But I mean, already the Quran tells us um, that it's that it's a bayan. So it's given in, a, it's, a, it's a clear sign of Quran, but it's revealed in Arabic. So it was handed down to the people um, of the time speaking Arabic in uh, in, uh, in a language that uh, they could uh, they could understand. So you see, already in this kind of assumption, you have two things coming together: a natural language, Arabic, but at the same time, the the uh, the, the the clear statement, the clear claim that it's it's used by 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 God, so a divine entity, and it's not only used by it because there is nothing other he could have could have used, but because it's also at the same time the best way to bring about to bring bring about in clear um, language in, as a bayan uh, the teaching that that he that he wanted to convey. So in a way, you have to square the circle of, on the one hand, um, this divine um, claim, this div divine um, um, dimension, and at the other, on the other hand, well, it's 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 in a way, an ordinary human language, a natural language. And this is basically what Ibn Jini does with his, uh, with his um, very subtle analysis of um, how language, in a way, represents um, um, reality, and not just by accident, because but uh, and, and this is this is not just um, so so to speak a, 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 an excellent tool uh, for doing physics um, like we could do as as philosopher, uh, but by using language and talking about reality, we best capture another creation of God, namely what is around us, so the world around us. So in a way, in his theory of of language um, um, tries to um, give a. Uh, give a, a rational account of how language can actually be, even though it's um, it's at once human and divine, can it, uh, can be um, um, a perfect um, resemblance or similarity or mirror picture of uh, of reality. Um, I don't I don't flesh out um, the, the theory in detail. I mean that would take up too much time. Um, but um, so on the one hand, you can just look up the chapter. But on the other hand, of course, if there are questions, you, you can you can always raise them. But this is also just to give you an idea of um, what kind of unexpected theories are around, because usually we think of Nahu as some very dry kind of explanation of, well, these are the features of language. And this is these are the rules you have to respect if you want to speak proper Arabic. Um, but but there, there, is, there are other, there are other things, um, there are other um, aspects to it. So, so to to give you an idea of these kind of richnesses, but at the same time, I mean, it's really a philosophical kind of um, of curiosity that you find in thinkers like uh, Ibn Jini. And I think that is what 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 we, sh what we should take as researchers nowadays, as historians of philosophy, what we should take seriously and and start to 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 um, investigate, to explore, and, and then to, to try and reconstruct. So thanks again. So this, this is all I want to say, and now I pass the floor to uh, Mohsen again. <laughs> so great, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should now, we'll have some time now to go to the questions from audience. Um, I think Sajjad, at the beginning of the session, had a question, uh, which was also my own question. Uh, about the nature of philosophical and 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 where does this stop? Uh, but but Sajjad, if you want to elaborate on this on your question, 
let, let, let me, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, yeah. I guess, you know, it, it's a fairly straightforward question, which is, um, uh, you know, I'm all for, and I, I completely agree with this idea of the expansive, expansive um, definition of philosophy, I guess. The question is, um, how do we define what is philosophical? Um, you know, um, there are, of course, generic boundaries uh, within this sort of literature, and and I'm, I again, I totally agree that we should go beyond that. But how do we, for example, um, identify a particular issue, a discussion, an argument as philosophical as opposed to one which is not? Um, which I think is the kind of the tricky question in this. Yeah, thank you. Um, which one of you would like to uh, well, answer the question or say some, some word about it? I can start and then maybe Mustafa can add something. I mean, we can just help each other, so to speak. Um, so, so I mean, I've, I think this is really a difficult question. Um, and perhaps, um, I mean, it's, it's a question which actually goes beyond um, philosophy in the Islamic world. I mean, it's a question concerning our philosophy, no, our notion of philosophy in general, I'd say. And, and of course, in the Western tradition, um, or nowadays, we, we have, we tend to have a very limited notion of philosophy, um, or at least oftentimes many people do, um, depending, of course, again, on their tradition. Um, but um, I mean, if, if, I, if I, as a historian of philosophy, look into um, the Islamic culture, um, the pre-modern Islamic culture, I think I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go extremely far. Um, and at, in, in the first time, I'm happy to look into basically everything that's written. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone who has written something which in a way is theoretical um, would qualify as a philosopher in my modern terms. Of course, it's a modern terminology that I apply. But nevertheless, I think some of the issues that um, you, you mentioned already in the chat, um, so you, you could apply to narrowing down a little bit what of the things that you come across you'd be happy or willing to qualify as as philosoph philosophical in its own right. And so I think in, in a way, it, it, I wouldn't even limit it to a specific kind of argumentation because I think that this already presupposes a method which is usually linked to a narrow uh, concept of philosophy. But I think perhaps most of us would agree that a certain appreciation of rationality and the power of rationality. So the, the kind of results rational inquiry can lead you to and um, an appreciation thereof. I think that is perhaps something which you, you'd expect. And, and even, I mean, I think even of, I mean, um, even if, if, if someone has a religious background and is happy to accept that there is a God and that there is a revelation and um, in a way is willing to move about within the framework of, uh, of these, uh, uh, of the, the religious doctrines. But, but in a way, I think if this guy, um, you, if this guy applies these kind of rational methods or method is perhaps already too strictly, but is, is willing to apply rational inquiry and reasoning, pondering, uh, of pos positions and pondering of, of meanings and trying to make sense of um, um, what um, the doctrines um, um, convey and perhaps also trying to make um, sense of what that, what, what that applies for us as human beings. I think this is also a very philosophical concern. Uh, what, or what, are, what am I and what am I supposed to do and uh, what, where does it lead us and how should I treat other people? But in a kind of reasoned way, and not just in an in an yeah uh, in a, any, any kind of doctrine bound manner. Um, I don't know whether that that makes sense. Um, so, so I'm I'm really very open to to uh, to, to go very far to, to put it that way. Yeah, if yeah, I if I. If I, if I may, may, I would, I would like add also something, because I'm hearing myself back, okay. So uh, the question, it, it's very interesting, and thank you, Sajjad, for bringing this up, because usually this is the first question asked. The fact that this is the first question 
asked all the time is also very telling. I mean, it's, I'm not answering the question, but there's a remark on the remark uh, because it needs a kind of uh, justification always. Um, now, I named falsafa to refer to this very specific field, which is a discipline which uh, crops up through the centuries, basically after the translation movement in the middle of the uh, 8th century and uh, is developed and continues up to the 20th century. Even, even nowadays, we have this tradition. There are many other traditions who we claim, uh, and I think Nadia is in this with me, that's why I say we, who has a philosophical relevance. Now, uh, in, in contrast to falsafi relevance, let's say. Um, now, um, in contrast to a case like Parmenides, for example, who would have no problem to be called a philosopher, even though the word philosophy did not exist at the time, uh, with authors who we are dealing with, obviously there needs to be a justification. Uh, because of the dominance of falsafa in this cultural space or in the studies on this cultural space. Um, uh, so let me give you a few examples. Uh, I think there is a kind of simplification which is dominant in uh, our approaches, our studies on topics in this field. Like, for example, the field Nahu that Nadia mentioned a few times, we have a very vague, let's say, a very broad concept of Nahu in the early uh, centuries, in the, in the formative period, let's say, of, uh, of thought in the Islamic world, where Nahu includes not only the codes of correct speech, but even deep investigations concerning the principles of speech. Principles which are verifiable and uh, expressed in a universal and uh, general terms, which have nothing in common with the strict or proper sense of, of, the, of the grammar, let's say. As we develop, obviously, these disciplines are more uh, distinct from, become more distinct from one another, and each discipline has its own uh, object, has its own field, has its own uh, problems and issues which is uh, which it's dealing with. But this happens only later. Um, so back to the question of of uh, Sajjad. Um, so. At the end, you ask with other questions relating to concepts, terms, and things. So this is obviously from a very uh, Aristotelian perspective, uh, meaning uh, presupposing this distinction between these uh, three fields is already uh, a, a, a very important philosophical presupposition which might exclude then uh, the possible philosophical argumentations in the general sense, which do not presuppose such a division. Um, so I think in this, in this, I mean, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I would be uh, completely fine with um, not even calling them uh, philosophical, and then calling them something else, if that's a problem of how, how to name them, simply theorization or, um, or some other denomination, but to bring out the uh, arguments that they presented in their own terms and as they conceived them, not according to the conceptual uh, and terminological um, uh, tools that we borrow from some other philosophies, let's say. Um, I, I don't know whether that was helpful, yeah. May I jump into the conversation just to add a few things? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Uh, um, yes, I, I mean, I would say um, I definitely agree with what Nadia and, and, and Mustafa said in the sense of uh, this expensive uh, uh, 
scope. But what I would like to add is that um, actually this is a broader question, as Nadia said, that is not just limited to the study of Islamic uh, thought. And and um, but it does speak to certain uh, one could say, say problems within Islamic thought or Arabic philosophy, if we want to call it, in in terms of. Uh, the, the main question that comes into mind is this uh, distinction between rationalism versus literalism of, of some sort, and which I find not uh, a, a dichotomy which is not helpful because it does, in a way, take away from certain uh, subtleties, as, as, as Nadia and, 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 and uh, Mustafa explained, in, in the sense of how are they dealing with these questions. Uh, maybe we are better off, basically, uh, just accepting that it's a medieval context, and by medieval context, it's a religious context. But that doesn't mean that the conversation is uh, has to be perceived in in, in this uh, literal versus um, um, r r rationalist uh, terms. In fact, one way about specifically about uh, philosophy of language is one uh, could start with the influence. So we all know that. Once Avicenna's signification, theory of signification comes into uh, the picture, every almost um, usuli ac adopted this uh, tripartite. And if you continue even in the post Avicenna uh, uh, pers uh, perspective, even in the, in, the, in the West, in the Muslim West, it continued with scholars, with the uh, rhetoricians such as Ibn Banna, Sejil Masi, among others. So that's one, one way to look at it, the, the influence of philosophy into, uh, uh, into um, theories of signification. But um, another, another element is, is the uh, argumentation that is used, how uh, how can we identify the discourse that they uh, they adopt in the in 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 their discussion of language? Uh, is it purely uh, does it draw on logical, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, conceptions, or is it purely um, drawing on hermeneutical? And if 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 so, why uh, in that context? And and the last thing I just would say is is distinctions are. What, what uh, Mustafa alluded is that what is really important is that to take these conceptions in, in their own terms and what is really helpful about them is that how they are, their philosophical, I think, uh, 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 um, character is that they really provide distinctions. And this is not limited to philosophy of language. I would say uh, if you look at uh, ethics, for example, it, you, you find similar um, things in in the uh, Mu'tazilites and Nashar rites, whether it's whether they subscribe to a divine command theory or not, they still they all do uh, provide distinctions, whether ontological, epistemological, uh, and, and I think that's that's an important element. So I I would stop too. Um. Well, thanks. Um, I think we have time for one other question or two uh, at last. Um, Ali Amini, as well. uh, uh, Hamid, do you want to say something? Uh, you, have, you have written down all I'll say. You, you'll say about the, the, the question of Sajjad, or if, if you want to say something, please let me know. Hamid Arizai is a professor of uh, natural philosophy in Imam Sadaq University. Um, so uh, until, uh, until then, uh, Ali Amini has asked, say, uh, uh, how important is Persian authors' contribution to Arabic language and falsafa, and how do you understand the contribution in terms of the Islamic civilization? So, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. No, unfortunately, I think if, if I want to be honest with you, I think it's too early to ask that question. And many of the Arabic sources, even, we don't have access to, and we, we cannot have a. Uh, uh, um, um, grounded evaluation of what's happening in the first place at, at, uh, at, at the um, general level. Um, I think Persian is, in, in general, I think the Persian language and Persian works are um, very important to be taken, taken into account as m many of these authors have been uh, bilingual in Persian and Arabic and uh, Due to the differences between the two languages, some aspects of the ideas, uh, as far as I have seen, for example, at the example of Fakhreddin al-Razi, come out 
uh, in the first Persian language, which cannot be found, or at least cannot be found as clear as they can be found in Persian in the Arabic. So in this sense, they're complementary. The Persian writings of Avicenna obviously has been highlighted by many authors, uh, uh, beginning from Moin and, and so on, are very important and in themselves worthy of uh, study and consideration. But I think what's important is uh, having a, 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 a kind of sober idea of what's being written in general without making, at this stage, this uh, distinctions, because I honestly think that it's too early to decide on that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now, do you have, have any further points? Well, I, I think um, basically the, 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 the basic um, um, notion of what, what Mustafa just said, um, I can just underscore. I mean, of course, we do have um, some, some sources um, uh, at our disposition and sources that have been studied in the meantime. And uh, sources that have been so texts that have been written by by Persians, and it's it's obvious that their contribution, um, and particularly to to the Arabic language, or perhaps we should say to to Nahu or these kind of fields that study the Arabic language, that their contribution is uh, is tremendous. I mean, just think of Sibawai and the, the grammatical tradition um, that, that builds on him. So so I think there's there's no doubt about it. But um, but as uh, Mustafa said, um, to to Says what it is in relation to other people's um, contribution. That's probably a little bit early at this stage. And and on the other hand, um, um, I'm I'm wondering um, whether thinking in these kind of terms that are clearly modern terms, whether that really helps us better understand the history and particularly the history of philosophy. Um, so um, that's why I also think or wonder whether um, this question would really help us develop a better better notion, better idea of uh, the history of philosophy in the Islamic world or in general. So if we just talk about the history of philosophy full stop and then um, also try to make clear that uh, the history of the philosophy in, in the Islamic world is, of course, a substantial part thereof. It should not be neglected as, as it is often in just general histories of philosophy. Um, so great. Yeah, I, I wanted to amend, uh, to say uh, uh, two words still on this. I think the fact that it's been, uh, the, meaning without getting into the discussions of how to call this, but I think the fact that many authors have decided to write in Arabic uh, or that it is in this Islamic context, it's relevant to uh, reconstructing their philosophical positions concerning mm -hmm. uh, different things. Uh, in that, in so far that it's relevant, I think it has to be taken into account. Yeah. Um, and, and another question by Sajjad about uh, concretely about the volume and w w why are the old chapters focused on the classical period? Uh, and there's no chapter on modern period, etc. Yeah. Maybe I can I can immediately reply to this. Um, it's related to um, the uh, few allusions that I made when I presented um, the general idea behind the book. So um, I mean, in the first place, it's it, at that stage it was of course a matter of um, you have to focus a little bit, and so it was the natural thing historically speaking to begin with the with the classical period. Um, but but you're right. I mean, the natural follow-up would be something to move move on chronologically, and yeah. and I'm not sure whether we can do that within this series. Whether they would let us uh, write a couple other books on philosophy and language. I mean, I'd be prepared to do so. But yeah. I mean, in a way, it's that's that's something related to the project Mustafa and I pursue together, um, which is basically to to. Um, to develop a history of um, philosophy of language in the Islamic world um, um, in the pre modern period. And so um, perhaps the framework will be a different one, and perhaps it will not be a multi-authored book. Um, it, de it, de it depends a little bit on how we proceed, but, but that's basically the idea that we, that we nourish, and mm -hmm. we 
it comes out of this original research group, but that's something, of course, which is going to take a few years. Mm -hmm. And and what are the next volumes on? Uh, I think uh, I talked with uh, Peter Adamson so some like a year ago. I had mm -hmm. some uh, live discussion we, we had in another platform. Um, he said there was there is an, another one on philosophy and theology in the Islamic world, or maybe not so yet. Not yet. So the next the next one is on philosophy and translation. So that workshop has already taken place like two or three years ago uh, in Zurich. So that will be edited by Ulrich Rudolf. Um, and the next one, I think, is on philosophy and mysticism, which is, so the, the workshop there is going to take place, I think, next year, if I remember correctly. And I don't know when exactly philosophy and kalam um, is, um, mm -hmm. is uh, in the pipeline. But there are a few which are already scheduled for the, well, for the coming years. Mm -hmm. And, and to connect it to the question, the first question Sajjad asked about the, the limits yeah. of philosophical, I want to ask concrete, more concretely about the series. Uh, what, what topic would not include in, in the series? I mean, uh, philosophy and X, what, what X would be to exclude it from the series? Philosophy and science, philosophy and art, philosophy and poetry, what would not include in the series? Uh, what, what do you think about this? Well, it's, it's an intriguing question, um, but, but I think so far nothing is to be excluded. I think it's perhaps rather <laughs> at some stage the, the age of the editors or death or <laughs> which prevents us from continuing, but, <laughs> but I, I mean ideally that, that's what we would like to do, to, to really cover um, all the fields, but yeah, it's a matter of time and people. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, so uh, I think we, have, we are running out of time. So if there is any other question, uh, please raise your hand or write it down here. Um, and if there's not any question, I would like to thank you all. And specifically, thank you, Nadia and Mustafa and Sheryl and David for joining here and for your brilliant talks and speeches. And if you have any other for the points, Nadia and Mustafa or Ferdinand and David. Also on my part, I would like to express my gratitude again um, to you, Mohsen, and uh, to our wonderful team uh, from Lidiac, and also to uh, this wonderful group of uh, scholars who contributed to this volume. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with them, and uh, uh, it's been an honor to have them all in this book. So I would like to use this opportunity once again to uh, express my gratitude to all of them. Yeah, this the same the same with me. And and also if you are if you have questions later on, um, don't hesitate to shoot us an email or something. I mean that's that's what emails are meant for. Yeah. So no, thank uh, uh, I myself <laughs> had some questions, but I think we're running out of time. So so I will be in touch. Um, <laughs> Um. <laughs> Thank you again for accepting the invitation and and being here. And uh, if there's not any question and point, uh, we we can uh, bring it to a close and have a good day or have a good uh, evening or morning, whatever whatever they are. Um, and bye. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. Bye, Thank bye. You, bye. Thank you. Bye.